um, sort of casual in the sense that you're talking to an admin that you work with rather than a, a trainer or a vendor or um, some kind of different uh, relationship. Um, so in the spirit of the original um, use of the term, uh, we'll, we'll kind of mirror that methodology as we go through the presentation. Um, so when we think about brown bags, when I think about brown bags, um, I think about succinct material, I think about focused material, and I think about example-driven material. Uh, the other thing about brown bags specifically is that they often are about um, material that is really specialized to what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So rather than learning Linux or learning command line things, um, you'll learn how to do those things within your team or within your organization or within some of the smaller um, factions that you work in. And that's uh, kind of where the example drawing comes from. Um, okay, it's not right. So, uh, just on the agenda, um, we're going to kind of go through this guide. So, as you create a brown bag, the first thing you'll do is choose your subject. You'll then create an outline, fill in your content, and then we'll talk a little bit about hands-on practices and just continuing documentation and how they relate to brown bag training. Okay, so subject selection and establishing scope. Um, essentially, this is the most important part, in my opinion, of creating a, a brown bag or, or any kind of focused training. Um, without selecting something that's specific, um, without selecting something that has a specific scope, uh, it's going to get derailed really easily. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about how that can affect the, uh, the entire thing. Um, yeah, so in the, same, in the same vein, properly define your topic and scope or do not. There is no try. If you don't do this, um, if you start out with a bad topic or a generalized topic, if you do not define your scope properly in the beginning, you will not have effective training in the sense that it will communicate what you intended to originally communicate. Um, so I kind of spell it out here. here. Um, I think that the effectiveness of your brown bag is a direct reflection of what you do in this step here. Um, if you do this step well, um, I think that it really sets the tone for the rest of the process you go through. Um, so scope is just really important in the sense that it provides the expectations. And it doesn't just provide expectations um, as far as what can or cannot be covered. It kind of provides the expectation of how your content specifically relates to each person that you're delivering it to. So when someone can relate something that you're teaching them directly to, something that they do in their job, it's going to become easier for them to remember, easier for them to retain, um, making your, your content more effective. Um, okay, and so that's kind of the, a, a case for specific versus generalized subject choice. And kind of go into detail a little bit about what I mean by a generalized topic and what I mean by a very specific one. Um, so these are two different topic choices. Uh, both of them refer to SFTP. Um, both of them were submitted at a different point for training. Um, so I'll start with the first one. It's just SFTP authentication. Um, that's it. That's all of the title, the scope, the description, that's all. Um, the next one, in contrast, is restric restricting SFTP users to a specific directory using a true jail. Um, so you can already see the difference between one versus the other. Uh, the SFTP authentication choice is extremely broad. Um, it's extremely vague. There are many different things that you could explore in that technology, in that protocol. Um, and when you define your scope and your subject broadly and vaguely, oftentimes the questions that you get back from your audience is also, are also going to be broad and vague because they are reflecting what they're learning. So, um, it doesn't just affect uh, the, the training in the sense of your audience um, affected, being affected, it also affects the way that you create 
your material. So if you attempt to create content without any um, direction, it's going to end up probably one of the, you're probably going to end up in one of these three situations, if not all of them. Um, so your material is likely to become broad or general. Um, because that's the way you started, that is the way you will continue. Um, you will inherently try to include everything. When you have no direction on what you want to include, it's very difficult to go through and say that one part of learning this technology is important and one part is not. And so it becomes increasingly, increasingly difficult to prioritize one over the other. And so oftentimes people will not and they will just put everything in there, um, which is not effective for learning. Um, and then finally, you'll get burnt out. Um, I can't tell you how many people have volunteered for a training or a subject that they're super passionate about. Um, and then they start, I'm like, hey, like, how's it going? Like, did you do this? Did you do this? And they're like, oh, no, I just, it was too much. I'm like, well, what were you trying to do? Um, oh, well, I just, I, I got caught up on something really small. Like, I, I just couldn't get halfway through the SSH config file. And I'm like, you're trying to explain the entire SSH config file? Well, yeah, that's part of logging in. Like, okay. When you, when you just say, I want to go over SSH, things like that happen. And it's very easy to just stop because it seems impossible because it probably is impossible. Um, so um, things change drastically when we narrow our focus. Um, and it, I think that sometimes it sounds a little counterintuitive. Like when we narrow our focus, we're going to leave out too many other things. Um, by narrowing our focus, we're going to skip over something really important and the understanding won't be the same. And I think that that's one of the main concerns for a very narrow focus. But the thing that you don't really consider is that when you do go very broad, you're not able to retain all of that knowledge. You're overstimulated, you're overwhelmed, and you may or may not remember some context around what you learned, but you're not going to, it's likely that you're not going to remember, especially like a brown bag, 45 minute condensed session, anything that you're gonna be able to take home and use. Um, when you define your scope narrowly, um, like in this example, restricting um, SFTP users to a specific directory using a true jail. So in narrowing it, you're actually learning three, at least two very specific things. And you can't, you often learn that you can't learn a whole lot on the command line or in bash without learning things around it. And so the nature of learning something well is that you learn better and you learn more um, rather than trying to remember a brain dump. Um, so if you get to something and you've found a really narrow focus and you've found something very specific and you've efficiently, effectively created your topic and your scope, the rest of the brown bag creation is extremely straightforward and extremely simple after you've done that initial work. Um, the investment really, really needs to come in the first step of, of defining and um, creating what you think is going to be something that you can, that you either want to take home and immediately apply or it's something that someone can do. Um, right away after you're done training. Um, and we'll talk about some things that lend itself to that kind of mentality. But um, the point is, is that once, once you've made that initial upfront investment, the rest of everything is a lot easier and a lot more straightforward. Um, so creating an outline. This one seems, this one I get, I get, a, I get a lot of pushback for as well. Um, because it can be difficult to stop doing, it seems like you are stopping from doing the work that you need to do so you can write down the work that you need to do. Um, and I know that I get frustrated with it sometimes and I, I understand why a lot of people can get frustrated, but things are so noticeably different without an outline. Um, and this is kind of an abstracted, abstracted example of something that did actually happen in a study session. So um, kind of just a conversation. So I basically asked, um, hey, do you have an outline that I can take a look at? 
And they were like, no, I don't think I'm going to do one. I was like, okay. Um, kind of just, are, are you sure? Uh, and his, his response was like, yeah, if you really need me to, I'll make you one. I was like, you know what? If you think that you got this one, that's fine. Um, he wanted to do a, a study session on a, on a very specific topic that I've just labeled X, Y, Z. And 25 minutes into that topic about X, Y, Z, I swear the conversation had turned to something as different as, but why would a lizard want to swim at night and at a time like this? It just doesn't add up. It was like we were on a completely different planet in a completely different space talking about completely different things. And it really all starts from not laying out, even just mentally, what you're going to talk about for the next 45 minutes. You have all of the knowledge to discuss, and you have a lot of useful knowledge that's around what you want to discuss. But if you don't define those things, if you don't organize those things, it's so easy to get caught into a, but did you think about this? Well, how come you do it that way? I've always used this command. It so easily will get away from anything that semblance is your, your original thought. So um, the outline is something that I compare to an ad blocker. Um, if you have an outline, if you make an agenda slide, um, it helps you organize your own thoughts. It can be, an outline can be used as your agenda as well, and it gives you understanding of your timing. So if you are doing something on a restricted timeline or a restricted um, time block, doing an outline is going to give you a really good understanding of how much time you have and how much time you don't have. Um, you start to understand very quickly where your gaps are and what you need to do in preparation for talking in front of someone. Um, as far as, so as the ad blocker, if you put the agenda slide up there, you basically give people a way of knowing what you're going to cover. So there may be something that someone really wants you to cover. And so they're, they're going to ask you right away. And they're going to be really, really excited to talk about it. It's going to be really hard to change their mind to go back onto the original subject. But if you include it in the agenda, they can see that it's there. And oftentimes, I will get a hand up and then a hand back down. And did you have something? Oh, no, it says you're going to go over it, so I'll just wait. It really helps you and your audience um, stay on the same page as we're going to get to you. We're going to get there. It's going to make more sense if we if we approach it in this organized order, but if you just wait, you'll, your questions will be answered. And once we get to that topic, I will usually make a point and say, hey, did I cover the question that you originally had? Yes, you did. OK, because those questions are usually pretty um, easy to, to pick out when you're making the outline, that there are so many things that you can just upfront provide that sort of um, discourages any kind of like distraction or, or derailment. Um, so yes, if you have an ad blocker that's working, you never know. If you don't have it on, you will immediately realize because you will be bombarded with all of these things. And I find that that always happens. And that's what happened in that study session is he didn't have an agenda slide and he didn't have an outline even in his own head. And so someone asked him one question and another question and another question that just came tumbling down. So I really suggest taking the time to do that simple thing will really help you stay on track for the things that you want to convey. Um, and and just, that, just as true for the outline, um, the next section, actually filling your content in, which seems like the most daunting part of the whole process, is going to be a lot more approachable if you have a list of things to do. It, if you are approaching something of, with, with kind of the mentality of, well, I know this, I know this, I'm good at this, I, I notice that people need help with this, it's, it's going to be really difficult to just do anything. Um, it can be hard to just get started if you don't know where to start. But if you have an outline, you don't have to go in order necessarily, but you have a list of things to do. Um, Making the content um, actual research and, and curation a lot simpler. Oftentimes, if there is someone who I know wants to contribute,
but may not be good at getting that initial outline made, I will provide them with one and it, and it almost cuts the time that they give me something back in half because they, they just need some kind of direction. And if you're the one doing it um, and you can do it yourself, then that's ideal. But if, if you need something and you want to contribute, I would say um, reach out to whoever is, is your contact or, or, or your leader or whatever um, and just ask for a list, a very specific list. Um, and I think that that is pretty helpful in a lot of cases that I've come across. So the actual filling in of your content. The most important thing to remember, if you are creating specific training for your organization or for your team, um, there are likely a number of examples that are directly available to you and apply um, specifically to what you're talking about. If you are talking about giving training because there is a lack of knowledge on the floor, uh, or, or a lack of knowledge on your team, um, you know that because there are requests that are not being filled correctly. You are able to measure, essentially, in some way that something is or isn't being met um, appropriately. So, my major advice um, when it comes to filling your content is to have examples um, of your actual work day um, tasks combined with those fundamental concepts. Um, because when you are teaching how to do a technical process or a technical thing, that thing has probably got 30 resources somewhere. It's probably in an OpenStack Exchange link and it's probably explained be way better than you could ever think um, because someone spent three years on it or something. Um, so the things that you are going to help someone with fundamentally are not going to be served the best in that way. The really valuable um, information, the, the really valuable knowledge that sort of distinguishes a, a newer tech and a more senior tech are those little things that they pick up. Is that invaluable knowledge about the process and why it got kicked to that team and why it didn't come out the way that we thought it would after the automation. So um, if you're able to take something that is a fundamental universal thing and then layer <coughs> your specific specialized knowledge on top of it, it's going to give your team members, your audience, a more comprehensive view of what issues they're approaching. It's not going to be, that's not how you do it if you Google it. That's not what the Digital Ocean article says. It's going to say, okay, I know that when we start doing this process, there is a, there's a bug in our, in our automation kits, and there's a reason that it doesn't work all the time. So here's the main process for adding a user. Here is the thing that you have to do right now to get around our bug, and here's a script that's going to do it for you. Those kinds of things are what you can be layering on top of those foundational concepts rather than trying to reteach every single aspect of, of what you're trying to convey. Um, and then finally, hands-on practices and continuing documentation. Um, so just to talk a little bit about this, it kind of expands on the last thing that we talked about. Um, there are a lot of resources right now out there for labs. There are a lot of resources out there for um, practicing things that you don't know how to do. There's, there, there are people like Linux Academy, there, there's open source documentation on Red Hat that is free. Um, there are a lot of resources that are already exist for practicing. If you want to create something very specific and very um, specialized for the training that you give, Absolutely. No one's going to be like, no, we don't want your practices. But I would say that that is one of the things that often holds back someone giving the training at all, is they think, if I can't do the lab, if I can't make the practice I really wanted to make, then I can't do the training. Um, my advice would be, do the training. Um, brown bags are meant to be delivered in a really specific context. And 
that does not mean, that does not imply that afterwards you have to have a handout or afterwards you have to have some way of continuing to educate that person. The brown bag method is about that informal, casual, um, face to face, remote to remote, whatever, um, kind of knowledge and practice that you get from a personal connection or, or, or someone that you know and with the same context as you versus some other random article that you found seven links deep. Um, but it doesn't mean that you always have to have something moving forward. There are really um, practical ways of sending someone a link and saying, this is a really great practice on this site. If you just do these things, it talks about what I taught you today. Um, that is a really effective way of combining resources that already exist to work with the things that you know and that you need to get across. Um, so that's kind of the process um, for a really simple brown bag. And the other thing to remember is that these things are meant to be a lunchtime training. They're, they're meant to be a short, condensed, um, focused kind of training. So you don't want to um, spend too long doing the kind of preparation. Um, if, you're, if you're spending an abnormally long amount of time, you might want to think about whether what you're doing should be broken up into several um, sessions because the effectiveness is going to be lost um, in trying to combine everything all at one time. So um, that's kind of what I have. Uh, yeah. Does anyone have any questions? I talk kind of fast, so yes. What's your like, recommended time box for effort put into a brown bag? That's hard to say. Um, I guess it really depends on how familiar you are with that topic. Um, I also really recommend doing brown bag training, giving brown bag training, if you are trying to learn something. So if you're trying to learn something and part of the process of you creating the material is learning the material, then it's going to take longer. Um, if you are only creating the material that you already know how to do, I would say I really wouldn't spend more than 45 minutes plus the plus half. So I, I probably wouldn't spend more than an hour and 20 minutes doing something that you're extremely familiar with. Um, that does not include practicing. I would really suggest that you at least read it out loud. Um, you'll fix all your typos like that. So that generally, if you're doing something that you're extremely familiar with, that. But if you're doing something to learn something, I would say it really depends on however long you want it to take, and however focused you are and motivated to get it done. Because um, learning is a difficult part of, it, it really does slow down the process of creation. So, yes? So you typically just keep it in outline format when you, when you deliver a brown bag, or do you recommend people write that out? Write it out in what sense? less of a formal outline, I guess. Right. So. Um, it, it really does depend on the kind of material it is. So I don't recommend having a ton of information on the slides. If you're going to give your slides, that's the other thing, is if you are going to give your slides out later, um, it's OK, I think, to put more content on them, because you shouldn't be reading them <coughs> for data. Right. You're kind of just re referencing them and referring to them, so it's fine to have a ton of information on that because then you can give it to someone who wasn't there and they can simply read through um, rather than having to be present. But typically, if I'm doing something, um, I am pretty informal, tell by my gifts. So most of my slides are gifts or um, pictures or um, command line snippets. They're not actual words. Um, there are a lot of words for me. so. Um, I think people also actually remember your presentation and what you have to say more if you don't put a lot of content on your slides. 
and you really focus on what you're saying and how you're conveying that information. Um, uh, one, of, one of the really big tips is stories. Statistically, people don't remember um, statistics or data that they hear in a presentation, but they almost always remember the specific stories that they hear. So if you can find a way to tie your stories to some kind of image or data set um, that you want to talk about, that is a really good way of doing it without having an essay on your slides. Anything else? You mentioned a lot of this is regarding like actually presenting something, I'm assuming, to your team or another member of your team. Would these same practices uh, affect like writing technical documentation? Like, could you use the same uh, techniques here? Um, so the same, I would use maybe the same general things, um, but there are a lot of nuances in writing documentation. Um, there's a lot of things that, there are a lot of things that you can not only <coughs> present in a more um, clear, efficient way, but things that you can immediately get feedback on. So you can say, hey, did you, does that make sense? Yep. And someone can say, no, no, I, don't, I have no idea what you're talking about. And so you have the, like, the ability to sort that out right there and then, but with documentation, you really have to be very clear because there is no, oh, hey, did you hear, did you understand that? Mm -hmm. um, so the process is different, but um, generally follows the same kind of steps. Thank you. Thanks. Have you ever solicited like across a team or an organization, like, hey, what would you all like to have ground bags about? All the time. And how do you get people to I don't know, sometimes I have a, you know, sometimes I'll just like ask your team on Slack, like, hey, what would you all like to learn about? I don't really hear anything. Oh man, I feel your pain so hard. Um, so, do you have any tips for like kind of sparking that, you know, like, oh yeah, I really like to you know, learn more about it? Yes. Um, the, the initial one, the one that helps, that helped a lot, um, is providing options. Um, it, again, sounds counterintuitive because now they feel like they don't, they can't choose anything they want, but they can always choose anything that they want and they don't. Um, you're right. I've sent so many emails to a distro list and gotten literally nothing back. Um, but if I send a very specific list, hey, we're going to do a study session on one of these three things. Which one do you want it on? And then that actually sparks a lot more a lot more comments because they're like, why, why was it these three things? Like, oh, well, because I just made it up because you didn't tell me what you wanted. And so um, not only do you get more feedback, but you also start to garner um, like a relationship to continue to get more feedback. So that was the main thing that helped me. And uh, do you provide a feedback mechanism you know, after brown bags so that people can make sure that they you know, improve and other people find value? Yes. Um, at the end of our study sessions, brown bags, almost, I think literally all of the training content that we have, there are surveys. Um, they're all anonymous, so uh, people don't feel like they're going to get in trouble. Um, we're, we're, I'm in a pretty large organization, so it would be kind of hard to, it's not like there's three people, like you, it would be hard to, unless you really knew who it was, um, to see who it was. Um, and aside from that, the other thing that helped me get more feedback, um, <coughs> as well as um, more participation as far as what people wanted to hear, is I literally just went and walked around to different teams. Just going and talking and letting people see your face, if that's an option, um, will change the way they reach out to you. Um, even, I mean, e they'll even do it over email or Slack. Um, after that initial, like, I don't know, interaction happens, um, it's a lot easier from there. So that's also how I get a lot of feedback is I literally just walk through the aisles of my department and people are, oh my God, I'm so glad I saw you. I'm so glad I saw you. I'm like, oh, okay, like what, what is it? Um, and so it gets easier and easier. But, yes. Cool. Kind of getting into a tangent off of brown bags, but do you ever use like Lean coffee or the birds of a feather sessions or uh, you know, lightning talk kind of things to get people interested in sharing knowledge? Um, so, none of I, I did not try anything that, um, like, that, like, 
easy, I guess, to, to get into. Um, I did try and do like lunch and learns. Um, so like every, you know, month I would commit to some kind of training thing and it would be open to anyone if they wanted to contribute to it. So it was like, hey, we're doing a lunch and learn this month. If you want to be a part of it, if you have something you want to talk about, if you want to train on it, um, there's an opportunity for you to do it. That Also, all of the training that I coordinate is open to literally everyone that I can talk to. Um, so. I, I also don't get a ton of buy-in if the, if the sessions are too short or too um, like non-committal, I guess. I, people, I, I don't know why, but it seems like people have to have some kind of actual buy-in to want to be a part of it. So that was hard to. Cool. Well, I think I'm like way over. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.